Greetings ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here and you like listening to horror stories, please join us by clicking subscribe down below to never miss an upload. Also, please leave a like before we get started. Thank you. I remember the day like it was yesterday. It was my mum's birthday and I wanted to get her something special. She had just recently started running and I wanted to support her new hobby. As I was looking through Craigslist, I came across a listing for a fitness Garmin watch. It was a perfect gift for my mum. Without hesitation, I contacted the seller and arranged to meet up with them to purchase the watch. I drove to meet them. It was in a quiet park on the outskirts of the city. Yeah, a bit sketchy, but at the time, I didn't really think anything of it, as in my mind, it made sense. They're a seller, they don't want a stranger coming to their house, and I didn't want them coming to mine, either, so where else were we going to meet? As I approached the seller, a tall, shady-looking man. I couldn't help but feel a little scared. I don't know why, but in my mind I expected it to be a woman. After all, this was a public place, and there were other people around, so I just calmed myself down. Here it is, the man said, handing me the watch. It's in perfect condition, just like new. I inspected the watch and looked it over. It seemed to look new, but I didn't know how to tell, as I'm not an expert in watches or GPS watches. The price was reasonable, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I handed the man the money, and he quickly disappeared into the crowd. I made my way back home, excited to give my mum the watch. She would be thrilled, I just knew it. As soon as I got home, I wrapped up the watch, placed a card on top of it, and put both of those items on the kitchen counter, ready to surprise her for when she got back from her run. The next morning, I woke up to find my mum already on her morning jog, using her new gift. I couldn't wait for it, as she was finally coming through the door, drenched in sweat, with a big smile on her face. She looked pretty happy about this watch. No way. This tracks my pace. It tracks my heart rate, my calories, my time. This thing's like a damn computer, Maisie. Thank you so much. I love you. For the next few weeks, my mum was obsessed with her new Garmin watch. She wore it every day and tracked her runs, constantly trying to beat her own records. I was happy to see her so motivated, and I was proud of myself for finding the perfect gift. After a few weeks of using the watch, my mum started to notice something strange. She would often see the same people following her while she was out on her runs. It started with a few cars driving slowly by, but then she noticed people walking behind her even taking the same turns as she did. At first, she simply batted it off as coincidence. Maybe they were just out for a walk, or a drive. But as the days went by, the situation became more and more concerning. My mum started to feel like she was being followed, and it was making her anxious. One day, she decided to confront one of the people following her. She stopped in her tracks and turned around to face a man who was walking behind her for the past few blocks. Can I help you? She asked, trying to sound confident. The man just stared at her for a few seconds before quickly turning around and walking away. She either thought that he was a man stalking her and he either thought that she was insane, both were the worst case scenario, but one thing's for certain, my mum was shaken up 
and immediately called me and dad to tell us what happened. That's when we started to suspect that there was something wrong with the watch. Well, not me. This was dad's idea at first. We laughed at it initially. But then thinking back at the guy I bought it off, it definitely was some kind of possibility. We couldn't think of any other reason why my mum would be constantly followed while wearing it. She wasn't a high profile person, high net worth individual, celebrity, banker, or anything to do with the secret service. We decided to do some research and found out that there had been a lot of cases of GPS trackers placed in watches that had been sold on the internet. We were both horrified at the thought of someone stalking my mum through the watch. She immediately stopped wearing it, and we contacted the seller to demand an explanation. But the phone number was disconnected, and the email address was fake. Every time we tried to send address to the mail, it would ping back. We were left with no way to track down the seller. It took my mum a while to feel safe again. She stopped running for a few weeks, afraid that the people following her might do something to harm her. It was a scary and unsettling experience for both of us. The police examined the watch and found there to be antennas that shouldn't have been in the original design. They were aftermarket parts, not parts that were original by the manufacturer Garmin. Someone had taken it apart and basically modified the whole watch in a way to make it traceable. When she finally mustered up the courage to go on a run again, the Garmin watch was no more. To our relief, she reported not seeing any more weird activity. It was a huge weight off our shoulders, and we were both glad to put the whole ordeal behind us. The police came up with some possible scenarios of what this was and why it was done. Possible trafficking, stalking, or abduction. Those were the main ideas that they came up with, but as always, stalkers who aren't directly related to it are very hard to convict. Looking back, I regret ever buying that watch from a stranger on Craigslist. It was only a hundred bucks, so it's not like I lost all my money, but still, it put my mum through a whole bunch of stress, unneeded stress. I should have done more research, been more cautious, and just forked out another 50 bucks to buy a brand new one from the manufacturer. But most of all, I regret putting my mum in danger. It's a lesson that we'll never forget, and we'll always be more careful when it comes to buying things from unknown sources. My mum will never trust a fitness watch again, and I can't blame her for that. The thought of someone tracking her every move is enough to make anyone paranoid. From now on, we'll stick to buying gifts from reputable sources. After all, nothing is more important than our safety and peace of mind. I never thought I'd find myself in this situation. It all started when I decided to hire a personal chef off of Craigslist. I was tired of cooking for myself every night and wanted someone to do it for me. I had the money as my businesses were doing really well and I had a dream of actually eating meals I enjoyed rather than the typical shit that I muster up, which is always awful. I'd found the perfect candidate on Craigslist. His name was Robert, he was qualified as a pastry chef, and also did a bunch of other stuff on the side, including working at hotels with four stars. He had an impressive resume, and his food pictures looked absolutely mouth-watering. I eagerly contacted him and set up a meeting to discuss the details. 
He seemed like a nice enough guy, a bit reserved, but I chalked it up to him being focused on his craft. I hired him on the spot, and we agreed that he would come to my house three times a week to cook dinner for me. The first few weeks were amazing, Chef Robert's meals were beyond delicious, and I couldn't believe my luck in finding such a talented chef. However, things took a turn for the worse when his ex-wife Sarah showed up at my house. It was a typical Tuesday evening, and I was eagerly awaiting Chef Robert's arrival. I heard a knock at the door, and assumed it was him, but when I opened the door, I was met with a woman I had never seen before. She had a wild look in her eyes, and her hair was dishevelled. I took a minute to realise that this was Sarah, Chef Robert's ex-wife, the woman he had vaguely told me about when we sat down one night drinking red wine. Before I could even say a word, she barged into my house and started screaming at me. You think you can just steal my husband away from me? I won't let you ruin our marriage, she yelled as she started knocking over vases and throwing dishes to the ground. I was in shock and didn't know what to do. I tried to reason with her, telling her that I had no idea that they were still married and that I had just simply hired him as a chef, but she wouldn't listen. As she continued to trash my house, I could see the hurt and anger in her eyes. I wasn't about to step in front of her and stop her. This woman was a maniac. I realised that Chef Robert must have left her for me, and she was taking out her pain on my home, but I had no idea about this. As far as I was aware, Robert was the chef. We hadn't even hugged, let alone kissed or made out. Just then, Robert arrived and stands in the doorway horrified at the scene before him. I couldn't tell what was more horrifying to him, the fact that his ex-wife was now in my house, or the fact that the whole house had been trashed, with thousands of dollars worth of damage in front of his very eyes. Immediately, once he noticed Sarah running through the house, he chased after her trying to calm her down and get her to leave, but unfortunately, she was beyond reasoning. The chaos continued for what felt like hours. Sarah broke windows, smashed plates, and even started a small fire in the kitchen. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I'd never been in a situation like this before. Eventually, Robert was able to get Sarah to leave, and he stayed behind to help me clean up the mess and contact the police. As we were picking up the broken pieces of my once beautiful home, Robert explained to me that he and Sarah had been separated for months. They were going through a messy divorce. He had never mentioned her because he didn't want to bring his personal life into his work. He apologised profusely and offered to pay for any damages and even cook for me for free for one month to make up for the chaos. I had just been in the middle of a violent outburst, and I couldn't help but wonder if Sarah was capable of doing something even more sinister. I started trying to look her up on Citizen's Advice. I did research on her, and found out that she had a history of being charged, also mental illness, and checking in and out of a psychiatric ward. A listing for a local school that promised to teach archery to anyone who was interested. Hey, my name's Darren. I'm a single father. I was always looking for new and exciting activities to do with my son. I spent most of my days working, and for most of the week, didn't even see my son. Weekends were like golden time, time that I could spend time with him and just relax. 
I immediately clicked on the ad and read through the details. The school was run by a small group of experienced instructors who were passionate about archery and eager to pass on their knowledge to others. They claimed to have a state-of-the-art facility with all the necessary equipment and a safe and controlled environment for learning. It all sounded too good to be true, but I decided to give it a try and signed up for a taster session with my son. What's the worst that can happen, hey? On the day of our first lesson, we arrived at the school. The building was a modest one, tucked away in a quiet neighborhood. We were greeted by a friendly instructor named Jack. He gave us a brief tour of the facility before leading us to the shooting range. My son's eyes widened with amazement as he saw rows and rows of targets and bows, pellet guns and different types of targets lined up neatly against the wall. Jack started off the lesson by teaching us the basics of archery, how to hold the bow, knock an arrow and release it with precision. He was patient and encouraging and my son and I were both eager to learn. As we practiced our aim and technique, I could see my son's confidence growing with each successful shot. But, just as we were getting into the groove of things, disaster struck. One of the other instructors, who was demonstrating a new technique to another group of kids, misfired as an arrow. It ricocheted off the target's wooden leg and flew right towards us. In a split second, I felt a sharp pain in my leg and saw blood gushing out. Panic set in as Jack rushed to my side, calling for help. My son was in shock, his face turned pale and his hands were shaking. The other students and instructors gathered around us and someone quickly called for an ambulance. As we waited for the paramedics to arrive, I could hear the commotion and whispers around me. Some were blaming the instructor for not following safety protocols, while others were questioning the credibility of the school. It was chaos, and I couldn't shake off the fear and anger and pain that was building up inside me. The ambulance arrived and I was taken to the hospital for emergency treatment. My son was too shaken to come with me, so I asked Jack to take care of him until my auntie arrived at the school to take him home. The doctor informed me that the arrow had pierced through my leg and caused significant damage to the muscles and nerves. I would need surgery and weeks of physical therapy to fully recover. As I lay in the hospital bed, I couldn't help but think about the events that led to this unfortunate incident. I had trusted this school to provide a safe and enjoyable experience for my son and me, but instead, I ended up in hospital. I felt guilty for putting my son in harm's way and angry at the archery school for their negligence. The next day, I received a call from Jack, who informed me that the school had been shut down due to the accident. The authorities had launched an investigation and it was discovered that the school did not have the necessary permits and safety measures in place. It was a huge blow to the community, as the school had been running for years without any major accidents. I was relieved to hear that the school was being held accountable for their actions, but at the same time, I couldn't help but feel guilty and responsible for what had happened. I visited the school with my son to collect our belongings, and we were met with a somber atmosphere. The once lively and happy shooting range was now empty and abandoned, filled with nothing but the owners, who looked very guilty. Jack apologized to me and explained that they had been cutting corners to keep the cost low and attract more students. He gave me every excuse under the sun, and to be honest, I think they were expecting me to lawsuit, but I didn't. I didn't think that was worthy of a lawsuit, and after all, I see it as an accident. Jack also mentioned that the instructor who misfired the arrow had been dismissed and was allegedly facing legal charges. I don't know why, 
because I would have been the one pressing them, not him. I could see the regret and remorse in his eyes, and I knew that this incident would haunt him for a long time. As we left the archery school for the last time, I felt disappointed. My son and I had been looking forward to learning a new skill together, but instead, we were left with a traumatic experience. However, I always learned a valuable lesson, to do thorough research and prioritize actual schools over ones I find on Craigslist. Months went by and my legs slowly healed, but the emotional scars from that day remained. The biggest regret and fear for me was that it could have been my son. I'm glad I took that arrow and he didn't. My son's only nine years old. He's not even five foot yet, I don't think. If that arrow had hit him, it would have been his stomach height. And that, my friends, I could never live with. I couldn't bring myself to ever do archery again, but my son's interest in the sport never wavered. So, I made it my decision to get a range in our backyard, a custom made up one. The targets, the arrows, the bows, everything. I spent almost a thousand bucks on all the equipment, knowing that this way, if an accident happened, it would be 100% my fault and 100% in my control. In the end, this incident taught me to do more things to prevent accidents, especially when it comes to the safety of my son. It also made me appreciate the importance of proper training and regulations and activities that involve potential risks. As for the archery school, it may have been shut down forever, but it serves as a cautionary tale for others to prioritize safety above all else. It was a chilly December morning when we arrived at the airport, ready to embark on our much-awaited skiing holiday to Switzerland. I could feel the excitement in the air as my whole body and my whole family, including my husband, two daughters, and son Ewan, eagerly jumped up and down trying to stay warm. As we boarded the plane, Ewan couldn't contain his excitement. He had been talking about this trip for months, and I was glad to see his face light up. We landed in Zurich, and from there, we took a scenic train ride to our ski resort in the Swiss Alps. The next few days were filled with laughter, adventure, and unforgettable memories. We spent our days skiing and snowboarding, and our evenings cozied up by the fireplace, sipping hot chocolate, and recounting our daily adventures. It was a perfect family vacation, and I was grateful to have this time together with my loved ones. On the fourth day of our trip, our holiday took an unexpected turn. Ewan, who had been skiing with his older sister, had an accident on the slopes. I was waiting for them at the bottom of the slope, when I saw the skied patrol rushing towards them. My heart dropped as I saw Ewan being carried on a stretcher, his face twisted in pain. What happened? Is he okay? I asked, my voice trembling with worry. He hit a patch of ice and fell awkwardly. We suspect he may have broken his leg, the ski patrol said. My husband and I immediately rushed to Ewan's side. I could see the tears pouring down his cheek. My daughter was crying too. We were taken to the nearest medical center, where Ewan was examined and given painkillers. The doctor confirmed our worst fear. Ewan had broken his right leg 
and needed to be airlifted to a hospital for surgery. My heart sank at the thought of my son being injured in a foreign country, but I knew that we had to act fast. Ewan was airlifted by helicopter to a hospital in Zurich, and my husband and I followed in a separate helicopter, which cost over $2,000, just to go there. As we flew over the majestic snow-covered mountains, I couldn't help but feel grateful for the skilled pilots and the advanced medical technology that was able to transport us to safety. We arrived at the hospital, and Ewan was immediately taken into surgery. My husband and I waited anxiously outside, holding on to each other for support. After what seemed like an eternity, the surgeon came out and informed us that the surgery was actually successful. But, Ewan would need to stay in the hospital for a few days to recover. As we sat by Ewan's bedside, I couldn't help but feel guilty for not being able to protect him from harm. I knew accidents could happen anywhere, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I should have been more cautious. Ewan, being the strong and resilient boy that he is, reassured me that it wasn't my fault and that he was just happy to have us by his side. I thought it was though. I shouldn't have gone down the slope. I should have let him go first and waited. But, as much as we wanted to stay by Ewan's side, we had to make the difficult decision to cut our holiday short and return home to Las Vegas. Ewan's recovery would take time, and he needed to be in the comfort of his own home. It was a bittersweet feeling as we packed our bags and said goodbye to the beautiful $20,000 holiday in the beautiful Swiss Alps. On the flight back home, Ewan, who was now in a cast, was in good spirits. He was excited to see his own bed and his beloved dog, and I could see the determination in his eyes to get better quickly. As we landed in Las Vegas, I couldn't wait to be back in the comfort of our own home. We were greeted by our family and friends who were eagerly waiting for us, and I could see the relief in their eyes knowing that we were all safe and sound. The weeks that followed were filled with doctor's appointments, physical therapy sessions, and lots of love and support from our family and friends. Ewan's recovery was slow, but he was making progress every day. I was grateful for the excellent medical care that he received in Switzerland, and I couldn't help but think about the kind and compassionate people we'd encountered during our short stay there. As Ewan's leg healed, we started planning for our next family holiday. We all agreed that our next trip would be back to Switzerland. Ewan was determined to conquer the slopes again, and wouldn't let fear get the better of him. I knew that our family bond had only grown stronger through this experience. As I sit here watching my son Ewan being wheeled into the emergency room for yet another checkup and scan, I can't help but feel like it was all my fault. Our medical insurance wasn't good enough to pay for all of this. And on top of this, he needed better therapy. I couldn't keep paying privately for all of these sessions. The chiropractic sessions, the therapist sessions, mobility. There were so many different specialists that I lost count and my bank account nearly lost all its money. I started looking elsewhere Ways that I could actually afford to provide for Ewan, his therapy and care was more important than anything, but it wasn't that important at the cost of making the whole family homeless. My husband had taken on extra hours, we were still paying off the mortgage, everything became extremely tight, to the point where my husband sold his Mustang, sold a bunch of his bikes, but still, that wasn't enough for Ewan's therapy. That's when I started searching. It's probably gonna sound stupid, but I found myself on Craigslist, looking for a chiropractor who offered in-house visits. Desperate and running out of options, 
I contacted the first chiropractor I found, a man named Dr. James. I explained our situation, which took around 20 minutes on a call. He assured me that he had years of experience and was confident in his ability to help you and heal. Relieved, I arranged for him to come round to our home the next day. But when Dr. James arrived, things took a turn for the worse. As soon as he walked in the door, our dog Lexi started barking furiously and refused to let him near Ewan. I apologized profusely and tried to calm Lexi down, but she wouldn't budge. Dr. James, however, seemed unfazed and assured me that he was used to working around animals. But, as he was treating Ewan, Lexi suddenly lunged at him and bit his hand. I was in disbelief and immediately ran straight over, apologizing over and over again. He brushed it off, saying it was just a scratch, but I could see the anger in his eyes. I offered to pay for any medical expenses, but he declined and just left quickly. I thought that was the end of it, but a few weeks later, I received a letter from Dr. James's lawyer. He was suing our family for damages and injury, claiming that the bite had caused him to lose feeling in his hand and affecting his ability to work. I was shocked and devastated. I couldn't believe that after all we had been through, we were now facing a lawsuit. I immediately contacted a lawyer and we prepared to fight back against the frivolous lawsuit. The whole ordeal was taking a toll on Ewan's recovery and I couldn't help but feel guilty for bringing this stranger into our home. But as the case went to court, the truth came out. Dr. James was found to be guilty for filing false lawsuits. After all this, we offered to give him remedy, in writing, way before things even went to court. For the judge, that was more than enough. There was no medical proof or evidence that he had lost feeling in his hands or had any damage done other than the initial puncture wounds from the bite itself. He was filing lawsuits that were baseless and trying to extort money out of us. In the end, the judge ruled in our favour. I guess Dr. James's reputation was tarnished, and I was relieved that we didn't have to pay a single penny. But I couldn't help but feel angry at Dr. James for putting us through such a traumatic experience. From this day, Lexi gets shut in rooms whenever new guests come round. If she's to be brought out, she'll be on the leash at all times. We started paying for a dog trainer also. Through it all, Ewan remained resilient and determined to recover. He worked hard, he tried everything he could, he regained his strength and was able to walk without crutches after around about two to two and a half months. Our trip to Switzerland may have been cut short, but it was a lesson in resilience and standing up for ourselves. As for Lexi, she became Ewan's loyal companion during his recovery, never leaving his side. I believe that's why Lexi bit Dr. James, because she thought that Dr. James was somehow hurting Ewan. While Ewan was doing the exercises, he was making groaning sounds, so poor Lexi probably thought he was being hurt. But I do believe in owners taking responsibility for the dog's actions. I am not trying to take away that fact. Please remember that when you come at me with your spiteful comments. The arguments with my boyfriend became more frequent, until one night, I couldn't take it anymore. 
David walked into the room, screaming and shouting. At first, I had no idea why. My blood pressure went through the roof, and I felt terrified that something bad was about to happen to me. Usually, David stayed calm in situations, unless something bad had happened. What had happened, you might be asking? He saw a scratch on the car. We shared a car. David walked to work as he was only three roads down where he worked. I had to drive as my work is five miles away. Whilst he was coming back from the grocery store, he looked at the back of our car and noticed a massive scratch on the back. He comes over to me and starts going crazy. To cut a really long and stressful story short, It turns out someone keyed our car. They were caught on CCTV in my work parking lot doing it. I proved it to David, but it was too late. He left, never messaged me again, and even after I sent him, his mum and his dad video proof of the kids keying the car, he didn't care. He left me with the car, left me to pay the rent on the house, and never spoke to me again. I don't know why he did that. I think he had issues, I know he had issues, but for some weird reason, I thought in my mind that I could somehow help him, or fix him with those issues. Now I realise that I simply couldn't stay where I was. I had only around $3,000 in my bank, and the rent for this house was $1,800 per month. We would split this 50-50, David earned double the money I did so he had a lot more savings, and I was also quite surprised that he just left the car in the driveway and didn't take it with him, seeing as he was the one that bought it outright, and it wasn't on finance. I contacted my landlord and briefly explained that I would no longer be able to rent there. He asked me why. I told him that I broke up with David. I didn't want to go into detail, as I feel like it was none of his business. The next day, I moved into my parents' house, and I now had David's car, as mine. No matter how many times I tried to call his number, or how many new sims I bought, he would block every single one. I tried to message him on WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and even our old Snapchat accounts from around 10 whole years ago. Nothing was working. He would never answer me, and I was certain that he wanted no more to do with me. Living with my parents for a week or two was difficult. By the third week, I'd had enough. My dad was trying to charge me $500 rent, which I thought was unreasonable, considering what I'd just been through. Mum and dad were retired, in their mid-sixties, and had no mortgage to pay off. They were sat on a house that they probably paid 10 cents for, which is now worth $800,000. I fell out with my dad, and now it felt like I had no one left. Just myself and this stupid scratch car that also got quoted for $1,000 just to fix and repaint. The scratch was so long and so deep that it needed a new layer of paint on the entire panel. Being quoted $1,000 just for what I thought would be a 10-minute job It was pretty insane, but according to the guy at the body shop, it's the paint that costs all the money, and the labour on top of it. By the fourth week, my dad started having freakouts at me for not paying him the money. I tried to come to a compromise, saying that I would pay him $200 per month, but he stayed firm at $500. I didn't think that this would go this way. I thought that somehow my mum and dad would have sympathy for the situation I'd just been through. Seeing as I explained everything that happened to me, to them, unlike I did with my old landlord, and my old landlord would have probably been more understanding than my own damn fucking parents. I started scouring for room shares, or house shares, but at the end of the day, I wasn't really looking forward to doing that. Living in a house with three, four, five, or even six strangers made me feel creeped out. Yeah, not my ideal way of living in a house full of random people who I didn't know and couldn't pick. 
The amount of times I spammed David's contacts those few weeks must have been insane. But he never replied, not even once. I tried going round to his parents' house. He was nowhere to be seen. His mum and dad answered the door. I explained to them what had happened, but unfortunately, they couldn't contact him because he had told them not to send any details from me to him through them. My hunt for a new place to live began, as I now felt lonely in this big wide world. All of that combined with working full time at a place I absolutely hate with a bunch of people who I absolutely despise. Word got out at work once my manager found out about the keying incident once I requested the CCTV. One word of mouth went to another, whispers travelled to every ear until eventually everyone found out the shit I was in. Some people tried to help, while others pretended to care and spoke to me about how they could try and help me find a place. I knew it was all false, false help, they wanted to look good to the manager. Well, that's not my problem. What was my problem was finding a new place, a new place with a house share where I actually knew the people at least, a tiny bit, or somehow trusted them. The first thing I thought of doing was to try and find a house share with only women. This would make me a slight bit more comfortable, although it still wasn't ideal in my mind. I started going on viewings through ads that I found on Craigslist for house shares. Some of the houses were big, and there were up to six people living in one house. To me that seems illegal, or just against standards in the United States. But I'm not a landlord, and no one in my family is, so I have no idea. When I turned up to one of the house viewings, sure enough, just like the ad said, the house was just women. One was around 60, while the youngest was in her teenage years. I couldn't believe the diversity, the extreme or polar opposite of each age, very old and very young, living in the same house. The people came together in the living room. They seemed like they actually got on, kind of like family. The elderly lady introduced herself as Karen. The youngest one was called Daisy. I forgot the names of the other two. And there were a couple that weren't in, so they were out at work during a Friday afternoon. I thought that the people living there were friendly enough, but there was no way of really telling. Because after all, a few seconds meeting in a living room isn't going to explain to you or show you enough about a person that you need to know. But I needed a place to stay, and I needed it bad. I decided to agree with the landlord and the tenants that were present that I would now take that final room that was spare upstairs. I moved in two days later, parking my car on the drive and taking the spot in the garage, seeing as only two of the people living here had cars of their own, and the garage was fucking huge, almost the size of the house itself. Paying only $400 per month here meant that I would be paying less than I was paying my parents, and on top of that, I could actually have my own independence. Well, within the confines of a tiny, 50 meter by 80 meter room. To most people, that may seem big, but trust me, it's not when right next door there are people stood by you. The house was huge, like I said, and so were the rooms. It was like a mega mansion, which I'd imagine would be in the millions if it went on the market. Clearly the owners wanted a source of income, and a source of income they were getting. When I first moved in, I didn't really talk to many people apart from Daisy. Daisy I could relate to the most, as she was only around 5 years younger than me, being 19 years old. I started to tell her a bit more about what happened to me and how I lost David. She was upset, and she seemed to relate to my whole story. Her ex-boyfriend dumped her two years ago. He never spoke to her again and she's been heartbroken ever since. I started to get along with Daisy. We went on walks around the park and started to actually get along. We went out to have dinner together, and we spent more time together. Like me, Daisy didn't really have any friends, so we stuck together pretty well, 
and soon became close friends ourselves. I was starting to really enjoy this house share, and while the other ladies, including Karen, didn't really talk to me much, there was no awkward energy between any of us. We were kind, understanding, and the house chores were done cleanly and effectively. But that all changed when Karen decided to leave, which opened up another gap. This meant that the landlord once again put an ad up on Craigslist advertising a room share. I wondered who we were going to get. In mine and Daisy's mind, we assumed that it would be another lady, as that's how the house had always been. But, three days later, the landlord turns up in his car with another man following behind. Keyword, man. This man was in his 50s, looked like a creepy stalker, and had the long hair on the sides and back while he was bald on top. You couldn't make this shit up. He looked like someone right out of a horror film, and as he walked up onto our porch, I could feel my heart racing, and my mind questioning what the fuck this landlord was doing. This place was nice, there's no way the landlord couldn't be more picky and choosy based on who he got in this house. Here he had gone and snatched the nearest opportunity, or some dumb first come first serve basis. As the man walked in with the landlord, he was eyeing everything up and down. Once again, as rules said when meeting new tenants, we had to all congregate in the living room and make ourselves presentable. I stood there with a fake smile while gripping Daisy's hand and squeezing it tightly to let out my nerves. The guy looked me and Daisy up and down like we were clumps of meat. I felt violated just having his eyes on me and I knew this was going to be the start of something extremely bad. Sure enough, this guy moved in. His name was Tony. He had the room that Karen had just left and moved out of. At first, nothing major really happened, but that's because me and Daisy started sleeping in the same bedroom. I guarantee that at this point, most of the people living in this house share thought that me and Daisy were now lesbians. Yeah, that's kind of funny lol. Tony had been living with us for around three days at this point, and this is when the first bits of weird behaviour started. First, he woke up extremely early and would always be the first one downstairs at around five in the morning. I used to be the early riser in this house, waking up at 5.40, that's when my alarm went off as I had to be at work for around 7am. I finished around 3pm. Now that Tony was always up before me, I started begging Daisy to get up at 5.40am, which was difficult for her, seeing as she only worked part time and was currently going to university down the road. Daisy goes to bed around 2 in the morning, so expecting her to have only 3 hours sleep, just to protect me from this creep, was kinda difficult. I give her credit though, she did it for a couple of days, but things only got worse from there. Every time I'd go down at 5.45 to 5.50 in the morning, I'd grab a shower and then I'd go and grab some cereal, coffee and some fruit. I started not eating or drinking anything in the morning because the second I'd come down those stairs, Tony's eyes would go all over me as if they were hands feeling me up. I felt so uncomfortable and so violated. The worst part about it all, Tony looked creepy, but he also acted it. This guy was the real deal. He rarely said anything, but instead just stared at you in this really creepy, kind of lustful way. By a week, I was sleep deprived, Daisy too, and extremely paranoid. We started searching to try and find a different place to stay. Eventually, things got so bad, that we stayed in a temporary motel, paying up to $80 per night. It wasn't ideal, but finally we found a new house share, away from Tony. So, that's the story how Karen messed up our opportunities. We ended up paying $600 more each, which meant that Daisy was forking out basically 100% of her part-time income. It didn't work out great, but we are good friends. I've never heard from David since, but thank god I haven't heard from Tony either.
Ladies and gentlemen, you have made it to the end of tonight's video. Before you go though, please consider subscribing if you're new to stay up to date with all of my horror stories. Also, consider leaving a like to show your support for the channel. Feel free to comment down below your opinions, criticisms or your reactions to any of the moments in tonight's stories. It means a lot, and interacting with my videos puts a smile on my face. Lastly, please choose to only watch real human horror story channels. Right now there is a huge flood of AI channels trying to take over YouTube. This is extremely scary and worrying to me as they are saturating the horror story niche. I am really really one to stress how important it is that you keep watching channels like mine and don't watch horror story channels with robot voices as in my opinion this is something that could destroy the niche. It's very easy for someone to set up this channel. All you would have to do is just steal stories off reddit and run it through an AI voice generator. This is what these make money fools are doing online, and I think it's destroying a lot of the niches, not just this one. Thank you for your continued support, but please be careful which horror story channels you choose to watch each night. I can confirm that I am independent, have no sponsors, have nothing to sell you, and I'm not part of a corporation or a YouTube network. Thank you and I'll catch you in tomorrow's video.